Hello and welcome to this week's Macker to Macker. This is our fifth edition of Macker to Macker and if you haven't been before then an extra warm welcome to you. We've been getting extraordinary responses to this programme and so it's a huge pleasure to host it. The term Macker is the word for the National Poet of Scotland and at the moment that's me. I'm the third modern Macker. I followed Edwin Morgan, who, if he'd been alive, it would have been his centenary this year. He was 100, he would have been 100 this year. And Liz Lockhead. But the term macker is actually an old term. It's been kicking around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it doesn't refer exclusively to Scottish writers. In fact, the nearest English equivalent for the term is maker or bard. Chaucer was referred to as a macker by Dunbar. So the idea of this programme is to pass the baton macker to macker, maker to maker, and to give you, our viewers, a lovely mix, a rich and heady mix of poetry and song. And this week, we've got a really great lineup for you. This week is a double macker treat. We've got two mackers of the week this week in the form of Meg Bateman and Michael Peterson. And I'm going to introduce them to you in a minute. But first of all, I'm going to kick things off with a poem called The Gallic Dog. I would have loved to have spoken Gallic. Um, I just don't know any much Gallic. And the only Gallic I do know, I learnt from a dog in Inverness. It was Mab's and Tummock's dog and it only obeyed instructions if he spoke them in Gaelic. The Gaelic Dog. The Gaelic Dog. This was for Mab Skinner. The Gaelic Dog refuses to speak English. She can walk all the way from Kilmahog to Aberfeldy through the pass of Killy Cranky without speaking a single word of enemy tongue. On return to Torridon, she shuts the door only if I say Dun and Doris. When I say Walkie, she tosses her long hair, fierce scunnert eye, even turns the heat the other way. But if I say Twingen, she positively bounds and leaps and licks my feet, so many kisses. She does a highland dance with swords, high paws, and barks in a breathtaking key, the Gaelic for we're off to Tipperary, Tierna Hog, Tierna Hog, who's a very happy dog. But once the Gallic dog did not eat for a week because her mistress went away, nor get any sleep because the new woman said the wrong words. Eek, biad was food and not biad. So the Gallic dog pined in the corner like a sheep about to be sheared, meek and sad and lonely getting bony, slim as a leek, dreaming the Gallic dog dream of biting English feet. So that was, um, <laughs> that, that was me reading a, a, a little poem, especially for Meg Bateman, who is a, a really, really fine Gallic poet that's joining us uh, tonight on Macker to Macker, and also is joining us on the top right corner of your screen is the wonderful Michael Peterson. I'll be introducing Michael properly later, but for now, I'd like to introduce you to the wonderful Meg Bateman. Meg is a wonderful Gaelic teacher. She's interested in language. She learned Gaelic at Aberdeen University and in a number of places, and she teaches now at the University of the Highlands and the Islands in Sol more or sake. She's the writer of several collections of poetry and she's also worked on several different anthologies. She's interested in philosophy, language, literature and medieval Gallic mythology. Her poems make us think about our times, make us think about the past and how the past interacts with the present. Welcome Meg, how are you? Thank, thank you, Jackie. Very well, thank you. And I'm sorry if I pronounced some of these Gaelic words in there. I could see you looking quizzically. <laughs> 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 did, did it, how was my pronunciation? Was it okay? 
probably, I think you could do a crash course at Solmo Rostig in, in the summer. I'll give you personal tuition. Oh yeah, that's good, that's good. Now you're going to, to, to start us off, aren't you, with a, with a poem about your, your mother. And at the moment you're in lockdown in the borders, you, you're, you usually live in Sky, don't you? But you're in the borders at the moment looking after your, your, your mother who's in her 90s, is that right? That's right. She's 95 and I came down for a week at the beginning of lockdown and I've been here ever since. And being here has made me think a lot about different stages of my life when I was in different places and how you get a different sort of mindset in different places. So I was going to start with a poem in Gaelic um, called Mother in Hospital. Ma had's an hospital. Nat lis han cherished for vla. Dusan a puhta trantalu, han a huain is noch kuxa fark, golan guyeth chiliak mantol, achan che a gadich no hula, a fine oxygen selepi, ha villishlum alan yadich, gusan la eg tanov, go forest. Mother in hospital. In your garden, the gin is in bloom, vegetables push up through the soil. Lambs have appeared in the field, swallows have returned to the byre. But the one who nurtured it all lies gasping in a hospital bed. And not till you breathe free will the breath of spring be sweet. You could think that was a Covid poem, but actually I wrote it in 2001 when the foot and mouth, um, when I say pandemic, I don't know, was around and my mother had spread mouldy hay across the road and covered it in disinfectant to try and stop the spread of that illness and she got farmer's lung and she was very ill with that. So it was a poem of talking about her love of nurturing plants and animals and also of, of her being so ill. But I'd like to um, race on with another poem about her because when well, I'm 61 now and I suppose I was 18 when I last lived with her long term and since then I've had short visits and uh, one of my sort of sadnesses, uh, I would say it's still current though this is quite an old poem, is um, how you can really touch on someone, how you can really know them. This is also called Mother. We looked at the stars for a while before we turned in with the dogs. And you said it was high time you learned their names properly. But you'll soon be among them yourself. And I will be the one trying to name you. You whose nature I have seen only as their faint points of light. As you labor behind duty, behind housework, farm work, books. And who knows if you have your reward for your care and effort and exhaustion. I wish I could kindle a joy in you that would let me see you whole. Or you won't be further when you go than you were tonight at my side. Well, it's locked down and like many people, I've taken to running and my inspiration for running, because I'm not really made a runner, I would say I'm built for comfort rather than for speed. And this is a poem about a young woman I saw running in Sky. Girl running, it's a new poem, I haven't uh, published it. I saw you running in the rain, your diamond face glistening wet, your plait streaming behind you like a tail. You said you liked going to beautiful places to learn old languages and run. Even in the rain, I asked, especially in the rain, you replied. You became a poem in my mind, alert and graceful and damp like a deer. And this morning, after a week hunched at the computer, I set off myself at a trot on the road round the bay to the township cattle grid, smelled cows and clover and bog myrtle, heard the murmur and splash of streams. And though I had washing on the line, I wished it would rain the better for to taste it all. Well, there was a taste of sky, but I'll return to the Edinburgh of my youth and, a, po and uh, a poem, it was the first poem I published actually, 
when I was in my early 20s, and it's about uh, Murray Place Gardens in Edinburgh. Black leaves on the grass, an acrid smell of damp stonework, a wisp of ochre fog lowering itself around the trees, looking out from sorrow, my father's great eyes, a leaf spinning to the ground, the motion of my spirits. All round, a cauldron of imposing houses, sign of an ambitious age, orders of classical columns that do not countenance human frailty. Gardens haunted by widows, failing, independent, walking in the wearisomeness of their days, their burdens concealed. But tinkling is heard here from the collars of the neat stepping dogs, and against the houses, tiny bright leaves are seen, with the shapely birch tree gently letting them go. In between Skye and Edinburgh, I was a student and then a young lecturer and then a young mother in Aberdeen. And this is a poem, Transformation, about Aberdeen, to my child. I was strange in this grey town till you came, little drew my eye, but you stand at the window for ages, watching the forklifts and lorries below. Last night we watched the moon skinkling on the slates, and this morning I woke to cries of light, light, the place transformed by the red winter sun but more lasting your delights gilding of the place, of every puddle in the cracked pavement, of the cemetery and scrapyard that I see through the window you breached in my barrenness. And still about the same young man when he was 18 and about to go to uni in Glasgow. I'll read this one in Gaelic too. It was with this poem that I realised there are different ways of belonging and sky that I had gone to because of my enthusiasm for the Gaelic language, for him meant something quite different. Ilanach. Hook me in shohu, gus can in a fian, as na kilu yakut. Gus a fi pachlui his dolche, no kulu gus in shen yiktu. Ach berok a chlun yiktu, idash to thy von skol. Margolis to Aniki me Kumbunu Ganachesa and a doyen Vishnachrodulum. Not heel shirk that the Harichin can two vacat re Turkish no bost. Agasanisht not yours, Samoch orum. Islander. I brought you here to speak a language you've little care for, to play the pipes perhaps, or at least to sing but it's rock you listen to back and forth from school. As you leave, I see you belong here in ways I hadn't thought of. Your loyalty to your friends, your inability to sneer or boast, and now your tears, and I am proud. Well, a rather different poem now. Um, that I'm inspired to read from this title, Macker to Macker, the chance of speaking to another poet. Last summer I was at a translation workshop in Germany and this poem right, um, arose from conversations I had with other poets about what poetry is, what poetry does, what we try to do, that sort of thing. And it's in three different sections. The first one is kind of about the ownership of a poem. Notes on poetry. You say he told you he was sent to disaster zones, had unearthed babies buried alive and pulled a man from a submarine heard drumming on the roof. Whose poem is this on their gulped air? Yours or mine or his? The babies or the sailors? Birds and poems share difference and vision. They swoop through the world in arcs of freedom, fly through storms, catch their quarry on the wing, make innumerable turns in their murmurations. 
break the heart when they sing in the dark and break it again when they sing at dawn. Poets make good company, not hunting facts, I said, but feeling, not feeling, you said, but a metaphor, not to nail it, we hoped, but to watch it fluttering in iridescence. Well, that's enough for now. Oh, well, that was lovely. That was lovely, Megan. Really fantastic to hear you and to hear the Gaelic, um, so, so rich. And to hear that those tender poems to your to your son and to your mother, you managed to it seems to me get across such complexity and such very very short short poems, ideas of of belonging and ideas of change really run the way through your your poems and the the one that you read mother about not being further away um, than you are now those last couple of lines are real real killers in a way they kind of they kind of affect you because they make you think you know how do we really form family relationships how do we get to know people it's in ourselves how do we get to know them and that that seemed to connect both of these poems the one to your to your mother and to your son would you say meg um yes and i often feel inspired to write a poem when i do have some sort of a realization or revelation uh, and my mother's she is very dutiful she's triggered well apart from when it comes to her love of animals or her love of um, bach <laughs> um i uh, and I, I often feel a bit inadequate, I suppose, that I, I can't um, light her up from within. You know, if someone was funny, if I had a good sense of humour, I could probably make her laugh. And then I would see this, uh, her more inhabited by something other than duty. Yeah, uh, we've got in the Zoom room with us uh, tonight, the wonderful Catherine Philpott. Um, welcome, Hi. Catherine. Hello. Nice to nice to see you again, and uh, it's, it's lovely. That, <laughs> it's lovely that you're shortly going to be singing a song, inspired uh, in in a way by by Meg's poetry. I was wondering, Meg, if, if you have any brothers. Did did you have any brothers, or were you an only child? What was the story no, there? No, um, there were four of us. And what what were you four? Of what brothers, sisters? Uh, <laughs> three girls and a boy. And I, I lost my older sister um, uh, 11 years ago, but the rest of us are hale and hearty. Did you find there was a difference then in your mum's relationship to her son as to the daughters? Or? Oh, I think so, yes. Yes, the son is, is the youngest and he's very, very loyal to her. He, com he comes out normally every weekend, but because he can't come out every weekend, I'm here. I think that maybe maybe sons and mothers have a special relationship, or maybe every child has a special relationship. What do you think? Yeah, I think well, I certainly have a special relationship with with my son. But uh, I think it's really interesting to contemplate when you're, especially when you're the one that's doing the looking after. You're often often in families, you're the one that does the most of it, and yet the the, the mother or the father might hanker for somebody that's hundreds of miles away and only comes every six months. So it seems to me often the people that are doing the hands-on caring, the ones that are there, are are, are not necessarily appreciated in the way that that, uh, that the ones are doing less. And it's almost like they they become an imaginary self. You know, they're invested with all these wonderful powers in a way that's what the song that Kat is about to sing to us has as its, as its core a kind of an idealization of, of somebody but I was really interested before we, we hear that really wonderful song I was interested in in knowing um, about the process and writing in Gaelic and writing in English do you write in the Gaelic first do you think in Gaelic do you dream in Gaelic and um, what, what happens and what's the relationship because I know that the units of language are technically very different and that you have to almost think about them as you as you would maybe a sign a sign language British sign language it's not like translating French yes. into English or Spanish into English it's a whole different way of thinking so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that well very often a poem starts to me as a sort of sense of tension that hasn't got any words and I have to think where is this coming from what is 
this paradox. And I think the first translation is from feeling to understanding. And sometimes if I'm in a hurry, if I'm going out to work or something, I might just jot a few ideas down, possibly in either language. But if I set out to write a Gaelic poem, I wait till, it, till the rhythm sounds right in Gaelic before I translate it. And I make the English then scan as the Gaelic has. But sometimes I write a poem like that last poem, um, The Conversation with Different Poets, that started in English and always was in English. But I think Gaelic has informed quite a lot of, of what I do. And Gaelic has these has this tradition of wonderfully flexible vowels, long and short vowels. And I have the feeling that my choice to write in Gaelic is very much like an artist's choice maybe to you know work in oils rather than watercolour it's quite robust and squidgy and you can do great things with these vowels and traditional Gaelic poetry is very very much a weaving of vowel sounds I think the sound of Gaelic poetry is much more important than the meaning the meaning is often quite conventional yeah it's a, yes it's absolutely interesting that, that Gaelic poetry is like song it's very it's a kindred spirit um song and often I remember hearing the great Gaelic poet Sorley Maclean uh, read often and Roddy Gorman and Black Angus and every time I've heard either of those um, poets I've been really I've realized that it doesn't matter so much if I understand the meaning but it does matter that I get the joy in the sounds and in the vowel sounds in particular and we've got a great joy here <laughs> to listen to and to and to love and admire the sound of her voice can you please welcome Catherine again Catherine is really a wonderful singer she she grew into loving song really by playing folk songs with her dad and they would explore different songs as you might have heard her talk about if you if you came to week two of Macker to Macker and she's got the most extraordinary haunting voice that stays with you reverberates in your head long long after she's she's finished the song and she's she's a student at the moment in Glasgow at Cardonald University studying textile and it seems to me that that level of being interested in textiles and in the layers of textiles kind of shares an affinity with song itself and being interested in the ways that the notes and the words go together Kat what do you think? Yeah, no, I agree with that, definitely. Um, I think one of the things that actually got me into textiles as well was looking at weaving songs. Um, my, my mom bought me this big book of weaving songs and I was just fascinated by the way that people had created these beautiful songs and melodies by the process of weaving and creating fabrics. So that's something that really got me into it because I also went to Butte Fabrics as well and sort of learned about that history and their weaving and their weaving songs and then and it all just, yeah, so it, it does come together really, really well. Yeah, that's wonderful. Would you tell us why you've picked this song this week? Yes, um, so I have picked a song called Davy Cross. Um, I think that it's originally performed by the Melrose Quartet. Um, but when I was reading Meg's poem, Mother, um, there was a particular line which really struck me, which was, um, who knows if you um, have your reward um, for your care, your effort and your exhaustion, and it just made me think of sort of everything that a mother would give her child in order to make them feel safe, in order to give them sort of everything that they possibly could so that they would have a, a good life. Um, and this song is about um, a mother who is widowed and she has one son who is sort of her whole world and she knits him this jumper called a Gansey. Um, and it would be, it would have been knitted in a very sort of intricate woven pattern, which would have been passed down generation to generation, and it would have identified him as a member of that family. That's why I've chosen this one. Um, Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Take it away, Kat. <clears throat> the widow cross had but one son, and indeed he was his mother's pride and joy. So she knitted him a gamsey, cable stitched by fine and fancy, and it looked like royal robes upon the boy. For she knew his bright blue eyes, for she knew his golden hair, and the gamsey that his mother made 
day was fine beyond compare. Tall and bright was Davy Cross with a shining face that never bore a frown. How the lassies smiled and sighed at his strong and manly stride. On a Friday when the fishing fleet left town, for oh, they knew his bright blue eyes, for oh, they knew his golden hair, and the gansey that his mother made was fine beyond compare. At the dance on Saturday, all oh, the lassies surely swooned to dance with him. As he held them in his arms, how they fluttered at his charms, and their hearts beat faster at his boyish grin. For oh, they knew his bright blue eyes, for oh, they knew his golden hair, and the gansey that his mother made was fine beyond compare. Then one dark October day, there came a storm which drove his harsh to leave. And that fishing fleet was tossed, yet just one single craft was lost, leaving Widow Cross a gazing out to sea. For she knew his bright blue eyes, for she knew his golden hair, and the gansey that his mother made was fine beyond compare. When just ten weeks had passed and gone, they finally brought us news about the loss. Seemed a body had been found of a sailor lost and drowned. And in our hearts we knew it was Davy Cross. For we knew his bright blue eyes, for we knew his golden hair, and the gansey that his mother made was fine beyond compare. But it wasn't eyes of blue, nor that hair's pale as foam. It was the gansey that his mother made that brought young Davy home. Wow, it's an extraordinary song, Catherine. Yeah. Really, really extraordinary. A terrible tragedy, doesn't yeah. <laughs> it? And yeah. you, you go, you go through that with her, and it's extraordinary because every time you get to that refrain, you're thinking something slightly different. The song sort of moves you on, um, refrain to refrain. Um, it, it's really an extraordinary piece. How do you feel when you're you're singing something like that? Can you see it all in front of your eyes? It's so visual. <laughs> um, I feel like for the most part, I'm quite um, picky about the songs that I do choose to learn. And it has to be something that when I hear it initially, it really, really strikes me. And that's what that song was for me. When I first heard it, I think I was at a folk festival with my friends having a great time. And then I heard that song and then it just hit me. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've got to learn this. This is an incredible song. And every time that I sing it, it's like I'm following the narrative of that boy's life. And it's just, it makes me sad every time I do it. Because you get to the end and you think, I remember once um, I performed it in front of my brother and he was listening to it and he was like, Oh, Kat always does sad songs, but I'm sure it'll be fine. And then when it got to the bit about the body being found, you could just hear him in the background of the room just going, oh no, not again. <laughs> yeah, it's, com <laughs> it's, it, it, it's completely devastating. I don't know why we're laughing in that way that sometimes we do laugh when we're, when we're actually devastated because it's, it's the same relief as Johnny Mitchell would have said, laughter and crying. But how did you find that, that song, Meg? Oh, I thought she sang beautifully, just, just, so sort of 
undramatically, just letting the words build up, the situation build up. Uh, it's lovely. Thank you. Um, and I think it's, well, I think it's still true that, um, well, still, I spent a year in South Hewis learning Gaelic and I go over to Eriske and I was trying to learn how to knit an Eriske Gansi. And I remember hearing then people said that even when the body has been destroyed by drowning, they can tell whether someone was from which fishing community all over Britain. Um, some was someone came from because of the pattern on the jumper, just just as you explained. Yeah, that's that's next to me. Kath, um, Jackie asked you, Kat, there if you saw it all when you were singing it. Did, were you? Did you? Does a film run in front of your eyes or anything like that? Yes, most definitely. Um, I can almost sort of see like picture by picture who this person is and you sort of see him as this like, like dashing young man who's got his whole life ahead of him, you know, all the local girls are besotted by him, they think he's amazing, his mother thinks he's fantastic and you can just see it like shot by shot and then, you know, it's like that fateful day where everything just sort of goes wrong and that's the really, that's the big turning point and yeah, no, I definitely do sort of see it. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you very much, Kat. And actually, Michael Peterson, that I'm going to introduce next, is a man who's known for his knitwear. He wears the most extraordinary, and he's got the most extraordinary <laughs> collection of cardigans and jumpers of any man I've ever met in my life. I, li I like uh, going places with him and seeing which cardigans he's packed. I've seen him have different jumpers in Barcelona than he's had in, in Dublin. Michael runs a really wonderful uh, arts organization, Noe Riki. They put on an extraordinary mixture, um, for extraordinary nights. Meg has been part of them as well, haven't you, Meg? Extraordinary mixtures of film, poetry, song, animation, all sorts. He's a wonderful poet. He's an animated performer of his own work. He cares about all sorts in his poetry. It's, it's extraordinary. He's got an extraordinary vocabulary and a really wide mind, and he's got a huge, wide, generous heart, as well as a massive head of hair. So please welcome to Macker to Macker, Michael Peterson. Hey Jackie, thanks for that. Yeah, as a knitwear zealot, my heart was in my, my hands throughout that uh, a cappella song there. Um, as you say, some people think it's my most identifiable feature, which is why I'm trying to grow my hair so big it'll engulf my head. Yeah, and you, you're a, a man who writes about his country in a very different way to Meg. And one of the reasons that I put both of you together was because I love the contrast of your styles and your voices. So you're going to start us off, aren't you, Michael, with a poem really in the voice of the country itself, in the voice of Scotland and all its complexities. Yeah, the big, the big throaty sound of Scotland. Um, normally a, a flash little illustrations from the book because um, this poem has been illustrated called Hello I Am Scotland but I've actually got the original there and it's a little map of Scotland that has urinated itself and um, which might have affected been a reflection of the political climate at the time in 2014 in some people's opinion. Hello I am Scotland who wakes every day in a brilliant mood as Auburn bursts cast filigree nets over foreheads and pavements and paint themselves on play parks. Up gets my brickworks, frost need alarms, wind shriek through my Munro, gossiping as another small dug sinks into deep snow and the day floats down like a feather to the sky. Ach, barks a father's voice caught in the breeze. Let him sing his song and paint whatever it is he cares to paint. I have a soft spot for daft romantics, and who wouldn't grasp for it when it really could be it? My cities, or even my rivers, salute the environmentalists, snail savers, wall walkers, ally of El Menash. Every day my ocean swallows 500,000 footprints, strangles gulls in fitted laughter amidst the salted corpse. Sea splash spears a drunken busker mixing up his cluster chords and I too forget such simple things. Perhaps I've never known all the numbers on the buses, the vagaries in roadworks, but I do remember 
bonfires and all the umbellies as whole families politicised breakfast over toasted soldiers and eggs unfit and fit for dipping. We jump without parachutes, so they'd have you think, skirted around each other's eyes like window cleaners avoiding a high up mucky splodge. It wasn't that at all, but more a faith than flying. Well, fantastic. And you get a real sense in that poem of the great big burning issue of the referendum as well, and of the ways in which families were divided and the ways in which people had very, very different opinions, but yet it's done or approached very, very subtly, really through breakfast in that poem. Yeah, I wanted to sort of galvanise and capture more of the conversations going on rather than the opinions. And for the first time, I mean, my dad, for example, had never voted in his life until the referendum. There was like this massive vote in electric, this sweep of political interest and galvanisation was flowing through the country and people's opinions were coming from all these different perspectives. But I wanted that to come out through, through the voice of Scotland looking down upon everybody congregated together, together, working out where this country should go and at the same time working out who they were as a reflection of that. Uh, absolutely. I remember, you know, as a, as a child, both my parents were only children, so I didn't have any cousins at all. I used to desperately long for a cousin. And I thought back then as a small girl, that even an English cousin would have been better than <laughs> none at all. <laughs> so I'll read this poem. Um, to your English cousin comes to Scotland, just as a kind of a, a response to, to that poem of yours, um, because that poem of yours really um, embraces divisions in, in, a, in a playful way. Um, English cousin comes to Scotland. See when my English cousin comes, it's so embarrassing, so it is, so it is. I have to explain everything, so I do, so I do. I mean, everything. I told her, no, what happened to me? I got scalped because I screamed when a scalp went into my pinky finger. Ouch! Loud! And Mama dropped her best bit of china. It was sore, so it was, so it was. I was scunner being scalped and I was already sore. So I ran and ran, holding my pinky through the park, over the burden, up the hill. I was knackered and I fell into the mud and went home mock it and got scalped again. So I locked myself in the cludgy and cried. So I did, so I did pulling the long roll of paper onto the floor like that Doug Andrex. Whilst I'm saying this, my English cousin has her mouth open. Glick it, stupid. So she is, so she is. I says, I'm going to have to learn you what's what. And at that, the wee gets tears up. The wee toffee nose says, not learn you, teach you, like she scored. <laughs> So that was um, that was a poem in a in a in a children's book of mine, and I, I really like uh, exploring issues of identity uh, in all my work for children and for for adults. And you do too, um, Michael. And this next poem that you're going to read for us actually makes us think about the identity of an oyster. Take it, it away. Does. Yeah. Yeah, so it was written in Paris, just on the cusp of doing that Robert Louis Stevenson Fellowship, but I was also on the cusp of a new relationship. So I used the device of the oyster to try and explore a bit about where I was going and this relationship was going. Oyster. Bums to seats, doing at the table. In every direction, universes beyond this room, glimmer, creak, sky strain, Though I do not notice, my eyes are lit candles. Chatter swoops and whispered words whisk up a clamour. The clink of glasses rustles bread in baskets. And she licks wind lips and then my oyster, kissing me, kissing sea, a lifelong vegetarian, un mer, un femme, un runaway bandit her pink propulsive tongue, a creature of its own. No bones in tongue, nor oyster, though a marvel nonetheless, a zinc pumped seabed filter system, oyster has many magics and mollusky mischiefs, is worthily lickable. 
yet she had never licked an oyster. Her tongue recoils gingerly, processing them flavoursome fecundities. The fleshy grope is silent and wordless. The moments after, noisy and weird, shake out this timid smile. Oyster, not to be bested, tastes, tongue, zaps, back, a shimmer to the spine from the aquatic journeyman. And I know what you may be thinking. How did tongue taste the oyster? Oof, best not to know. See, this moment, six months back, was its own never, never land. A whole hunk of would never happen, no hope in hell. Yet here we are, plucky, as moon, still out in morning, sat together in Paris's Latin Quarter, watching with the een of plotting seagulls, this salt lace mystery trip unravel. I'm staring down both barrels at your stars, born out of sparks. You licked my oyster. You are the oyster licker. One brilliantly bizarre little alien meets another for pearlescent new discovery. Clink the glass for the very oyster you licked echoes down my throat now. The mischief in your mollusk, my tongue understands. Okay, so from oysters, I'm going to jump on to a poem about the Yuletide ride, the festive season. It seemed to be the natural course of action. Um, it's a poem called Fancy Dress for Fancy Folk, again, about the different masks and disguises we wear. We, us pair, in beautiful wigs, shimmy through the busy streets. Our moon faces full like Christmas bellies. Our coy, curling grins greet friends and strangers. Hello! And very, very, very nice. And soon we must. Yes, yes. We get home exhausted. Unclip our smiles. They fall to the ground with the heavy thud of metal chains. An evening wraps us. Wrapped in its heft, we are a new fur coat. We let our wigs slip from our scalps. Peel open and undress. Think the first peak of banana beneath skin. Looks right rough, what's underneath? Until you touch it, treat it to a cheek rub. Such secrets we keep. Nearly naked, all our little aerials on. Ready to receive the body, its treacle, its gloss. Mission control, they need not be bright like beach life. Just need a good scour of sun, sea, sand and salt. Fix your bones to mine. Become a poikal bow, for it is Christmas Eve, and us in high heels, clogs, frocks, and frowns are now in none. Us in public are now in private. So come, let us strip together forever, eat snow, warn each other to enjoy it, for in the bigger picture, this hot, fleshy love holds us only for seconds. A snowflake on the tongue. Okay. I tend to memorise all my poems and hide behind my fringe a lot of the time when I'm reading them, but this one is brand new. Um, so I've got the paper. But I'll maybe hide it below the camera so it feels like I've memorised it too. It's called Unfirmly Thatched, and it comes out of my research into thatch roofing, love and heartbreak. I think of all this fleshy grasping, clasped hands, bodies zipped together, in terms of rustic roofing, a thatched cottage like those in Vincent's painting, thatched cottages and houses, grassy hopes bundled into yelms, stapled like resolutions by swathes of hazel sticks. Canny creatures can, good quality thatching last near 50 years, insulates economically, rakes the breeze all medieval chic. Over hard winter's spleen, it's balding, a spar coating, fresh wrapping for festering wounds. Life's stationary, the way we dress up for parties to hide hurt and remind those we fancy what we look like since they've not been paying attention. Yet one squall, one waver, can strip us to the fragile rigging, a subtle shift from OK to KO, our little thatched heart unraveled into dead stock, water wreath, sedge, purpleless heather, 
a molding lime in a bowl of plastic bananas, a crepuscular rock roosting to sun up, to the stormy bits where trusted friends in moments weakened, lust after what we love, possessed by the very same rapture, skewed, easy to hold the hammer, hard to hammer home the blame of the stodge in our bellies, a forgetful slip on a drink too many, a thought gone sloppy for the thrill in being someone's newest ride. Nickerless, we risk everything, despite being unwilling to gamble even buttons on it. Fodder from the roof that crowned Christmas. A thousand times it doesn't budge until one day it does. No melody to what happens here. A fire fed on junk, soon blazing through our treasured chattels. Possessions tossed on in a panic to plunk up the smoking plumes. To the haunting shadow, to the hush before the plunge. I'm sorry, really, really sorry. Please take it back before it's ash, goo, gone. So maybe it doesn't. Fright steady something yet to wobble. A new day arrives like fresh bread. Closer for nearly being so far apart. I loved you heaps when I dreamed of losing you. As now and in between. Oh, our fecund cores. These scanty laureates of love. Here we are snogging, sticky equally terrified, risking it all on each other, hoping the stitches hold, the roof doesn't shred, hoping the scorch that kept the chimney busy, our toes purring warm by the fire, isn't throttled by wind. We should have never left the tenements. We should pick and dry the straw. Okay, I'm going to canter on to my final poem which uh, was my attempt at children's poetry, and then it got a little bit adult. It's called Highland Coo, and it is about a Highland Coo. There's this illustration of the coo there, with its shaggy fringe over its eyes, which I think I'm starting to morph into at this point in time. It's pretty Scottish. Someone called it the most Scottish thing they'd ever heard. I took that as a compliment. Highland Coo, you are ginger and massive. No effulgent, like iron brew, but light and sandy, pollens and rust. King of Celts, lionized as thistles and urabi, your pus or postcards, tea towels and them rubbishy tins. You'd be fine in London or America, alien of extraordinary abilities, but those hooves would need trot anywhere else. Coo, your horns are like Triassic tusks atop your head. Reckon you could square go a tiger if bullied into it. Put desperate down on his ears. Boop. Nay bother. But you're no bam, coo. No. Starting nothing with nay one. Fringe over your ear, bonfire and on belly. Sure, you play it cool. Scoff grass. Scarch yourself rotten on fences. Power through. A shitey weather, take a plunge in the modest sun, drink it in as you've always done. <laughs> I just love that. I love your Highland coup. It's just, uh, I, I like that scat yourself rotten. <laughs> yeah. I just, you just get the whole movement of the, of the animal. You really get a sense that you, you studied them or that you know them well. They're so interesting, aren't they? Uh, Highland coups. Yeah, it's as if they're wearing these big, fat, thick rugs, and when it's sunny outside, they'll do anything to cool themselves down or scratch those itches. And um, I was doing a residency in Cove Park, actually, and was just watching these Highland Coos daily as I was trying to write, and I thought I'd be doing the world a disservice if I didn't at least try and write some sort of pain or homage to the coo. You definitely, you definitely have done that. And also you've done a homage to the thatched roof in the poem before that, because I thought that was an extraordinary new poem. It takes you uh, in all of these different directions. And a bit like we were talking about with, with uh, Davy Cross and the, and the knitwear, you get the sense of the thatched roof telling the story of love, really, and of, of apologies and of recrimina recriminations and, and regret. And you managed to put all of that into a thatched roof in one of these cottages that you might rent at Christmas. 
Yeah, I mean, I just they look so fairy tale like, but then if you think about all of the like all, everything that's died to be there and just the drama of them unfolding and whether you can piece it back together and all of the histrionics of just having this really aesthetically pleasing thing and something that brings you happiness but can just as easily sort of tear the whole household apart. And I thought, hmm, that sounds a little bit like heartbreak and love. Exactly. And it's, it's interesting, isn't it, as a writer, when you have the, a notion, when you have a metaphor to run with, and you run with it, not just in a single image or in a single line, but throughout the entire poem, as you've done in, in that poem. Uh, so it feels like something that you're sustaining right the way through, like a kind of long distance run. Does it, is that how it feels to you when you when you conceive of a metaphor and take it running through an entire poem? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I love a good metaphor, but one that can stretch out through a poem is sometimes requires so much complexity and actually try to edify myself about facts roofing and the more that I discovered about it the more a, a sort of a, a more of a sentient being it felt especially knowing that it came from all these trees and different flowers and and where it went with that but yeah to really absorb yourself in one metaphor for like this entire piece of writing it's such an interesting process to do and, and how interesting is it for you? Because you're saying that you were, you know, you took in the in the cow, um, when when you were in a particular part of southern southern Scotland, and then you're taking in a thatched roof in a different place. And then I know that you've spent a lot of time in in France. And then at this particular moment, you're in Glasgow, and we're living through these particular times, these lockdown times, but also living through these extraordinary times where we're watching on the news and um, the, the the funeral yesterday of George Floyd. We're watching the, the statue come down in Bristol the day before yesterday. And how much do events, current events, feed their way into your poetry? And how much do you find as a as a white writer um, racism you, that you have something that you want to say about, about racism or how much does racism hurt you? Yeah, I guess it I mean it's a super interesting question and obviously at the one point we're the most internationally connected that we've ever been to people that we might try and call comrades or allies all across the world at this point in time. And then on the other hand, a lot of us are in the most confined anchorages we've ever been in. I guess it's seeing what that heartbreak translates into because I think any sentient creature has felt so much heartbreak over the last while, but in that has been a wakening up of how far we've got to go. Um, bringing that, I guess, closer to home. It's so important for us to address the concept that racism in Scotland is, is not minimal. That's a completely apocryphal thing to say, and it's a really dangerous mistruth. And people are learning to focus their anger and their upset. Some people are politically galvanized for, in some ways, the first time in their lives, um, depending how they've related to different things. And there are positive ripples uh, being taken, statutes are being taken down, plaques are being attached to them, uh, we're exposing huge pay gaps and particularly the publishing industry but all across there and really we're just seeing these examples of, of things we have to teach ourselves and steps we have to take to make this a bigger and bolder conversation and for all the people that have been galvanized and heartbroken about this and have seen a way whether it's one of these uh, citywide protests or the online protests to actually express their anger and their upset. It's just so important to make sure that they don't come complacent and they don't think that that's been a short, that that's achieved any solution. Really, it's just started to open up the bigger and bolder conversations and we just, we just can't be complacent about where it goes from now. No, absolutely. And isn't it, it's interesting, the whole debate about statues, because there's so many people that, that were applauded the, the statue coming down of Colston in Bristol and people that are saying the statue of Dundas in Edinburgh needs to come down too and that Buchanan Street in Glasgow needs to be renamed and that people need to know in Glasgow why Jamaica Street, Jamaica Street and Virginia Street, Virginia Street. What, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, there's such a dichotomy in it. In one sense, it's like, well, if we take it down, are we, are we hiding a history? Is it better to put up a plaque which says this is what this person does? Um, but I think we can't escape the fact that a statue of someone is celebrating them, even if there is caveats put to their particular history. And in the way that all great museums sometimes take down pieces of art and revolve them in their collection, there's so many inspirational figures out there at the moment that 
I just think that these statues have to go. I mean, the closest one for me is there being the one of Dundas in Edinburgh up on that huge plinth like, overlooking the city. I just think there's so many worthy voices within Scottish history that could replace that statue at that point in time. So I, in, at this point in my sort of inquiry, education about it would definitely favour taking these statues down. It's interesting because people often think about history as something that is static and immovable and the present is something that fluctuates and is fluid, but actually history was fluid too and our approaches to history is fluid too. I mean, Toni Morrison, the great African-American writer, said there was more future in the past than there is in the future. And that's an idea that really interests me, particularly at the moment, living through these COVID days and nights, at how we try and grapple with the past and with the future is something that's an ongoing conversation. So at this moment, I'd like to bring Meg back in, who's also got a cow poem, but her cow poem also makes you think about the past and its relationship to the present. Um, <laughs> yes, my, uh, my cow isn't as vividly envisaged as, as um, Michael's there at all. That was a terrific poem. Um, I was writing about Elgol, a well-known beauty spot in Sky, and I was seeing how how differently a local crofter saw it, and myself as an incomer um, tinged with romanticism. So it's really contrasting our two our two views, and it's called Elgol Two Views. I looked at the old postcard, the houses like a growth from the soil, the peaks towering above them a sign of the majesty of God before an amenity was made of mountains or a divide between work and play, between the sacred and the secular. And I passed the picture to the old man. Does it make you sad, Lachy? I asked, as he scrutinised it in silence. Sad? Bah, not at all. I just couldn't place her for a moment. And he pointed to a cow in the foreground. That's Yellow Lady, Red Lady's second calf. I'd know any cow you see that belonged here in my lifetime. Yeah, that's, that's just um, fantastic, that poem. I love the way that you get that, that mix of the old and the new. It reminded me of when I was in Sky, actually. My, my son, who's now 30, but his first sentence he said in Sky, and uh, all these cows gathered uh, right down in sleep. They all gathered in the road. And then we suddenly realised that we were protecting a cow and a calf was being born. So that was his first sentence. Cow born. Oh. <laughs> Which is a, kind of a pretty cool first sentence. You know, it yes. just came out. It just came out fun. And it also reminded me of the time when I was in Sky in, in the Yard of Sleet. And a man asked me, have you been to the north of the island? And I said, yes, I've been up to Portree. He said, I didn't like it up there. It's much too commercialised. <laughs> he was talking about three shops or something. Everything's yes. absolutely, everything's absolutely relative. Um, at this point, I'd love to bring back our wonderful Catherine Philpott, who is going to sing us another song. And um, this is just such a beautiful song. You're going to have us all in, in bits. Catherine, can you tell us a little bit about it and why you've chosen it? Yes, yeah, so um, I chose this song in response to Hello, I Am Scotland. Um, but I feel like every time I come on here, I'll take a poem that's actually quite cheery or something and just sort of turn it a little bit sad. So I apologise in advance for doing that once again. Um, but for this, it was, um, for this poem, I chose the song Here's the Tender Coming, which is about, I think, I think it's the boats are called tenders I believe and they would take men predominantly from Newcastle and Sunderland and take them off to fight in the French Revolution and um, so in Hello I'm Scotland there is a line which says every day my oceans swallow 500,000 footprints and I know that's actually supposed to be so that's quite a nice image of, so like holiday makers and things like that but I sort of link this to sort of the ports within so like Newcastle and Sunderland and things like that taking 500,000 men per day off, they probably would never come back. It's quite a morbid comparison, so I apologise. <laughs> but it's a lovely song, so I hope the song makes up for how depressing the, the link is. 
He is the tender coming, pressing all the men. Oh dear Henny, what will we do then? He is the tender coming, offered shields bar. He is the tender coming. Full of men and war. Hide ye, can ye, henny? Hide yourself away. Hide ye till the frigate makes for Druidge Bay. If they take the Geordie, who's to win our bread? Me and little Jackie. Better off be dead. He is the tender coming, stealing off me, dear. Oh, dear Henny, they'll ship you out of here. They will ship you far, and that is what it means. He is the tender coming. Full of red marines. Hey, bonnie lassie, let's gang to the law to see the tender lion off at shields bar. With her colours flying, anchor at her bow, they took me, bonnie laddie. Best of all the crew, here's the tender coming, stealing off me, dear. Oh, dear Henny, they'll ship you out of here. Whoa, fantastic. As I say, very sad, but it's got a nice wee melody, so <laughs> hope that makes up for it. Yeah, it's wonderful and beautifully, beautifully, beautifully sung. What did you think, Michael? Yeah, incredible. And, and I did think of the footprints of being all of these people that were getting disappeared by the ocean as well. And in yeah. the song, you got this real resonance of the hello and goodbye. And can you both sort of envision yourself watching someone you love seeping off into the abyss? Yeah, I think it could also possibly link to Meg's poem of, sort of motherhood as well, because a lot of the times that these men were taken off, the mothers would protest quite violently and they would sort of try and like hide their sons away because they obviously knew that if they left, they probably would not be coming back. And so it is that sense of like trying to protect your child and keep them from coming to harm in a time that is really quite difficult. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What did you think, Meg? I, I very much enjoyed it. Yes, and I love the delivery again. Fantastic. Well, this has been a really um, spectacular edition, I like to call it, of Macker to Macker. I'd like to thank very much everybody to coming, for coming. Thank you to Meg Bateman. Thank you to Michael. <laughs> thank you to Michael Peterson. And thank you to Catherine Philpott. This has been our fifth Macker to Macker. And next week, Michael, I'd like you to announce to us who is the Macker going to be? So oh, for number six, one of Scotland's and therefore one of the world's best known crime writers, the official sponsor of Rafe Rovers, Val McDermott. Wonderful, that's right. I'm really looking forward to having Val McDermott on next week's Macker to Macker. This whole series has been made possible by the support and the funding of the National Theatre of Scotland who are hosting this on their YouTube channel of Edinburgh International Book Festival of Home Manchester and of the School of Arts and Media in Salford. Thank you to all of them um, for their support. It's been really good to be able to pay artists and writers who often, and musicians who often fall through the crack these days. And it's been really wonderful to put together this wee heady mix of music and poetry and great to hear the Gaelic. Thanks very much for joining us. See you next week on Macker to Macker. But before I go, I'd like Meg to say what her bookshop is, where you can go and order her wonderful books, and Michael also to tell of his favourite bookshop. 
Belty Books in Whitton. And I went for Portobello Books in Edinburgh. Fantastic. See you next week on Macker to Macker. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.